She's a killer so entirely unfazed by her monstrous actions that she was seen smirking at the camera during her own murder trial. But this chilling detail is only just scratching the surface of this case's depravity. Taylor Shabiznes is a morbidly complex individual that had displayed many red flags in the years before her crimes. And after murdering her lover, she outraged an entire nation. So who precisely is Taylor Shabiznes? What were the events that followed in court? And more importantly, who was Shad Therian? Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at a case that'll leave your heart frozen while your blood boils. Of course, I'm talking about the recently concluded case of Taylor Shabiznes, who was found guilty of murdering her lover, Shad Therian, just last week. And I have to tell you, this case is a very hard one to swallow. By the way, welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. I post true crime and strange cases here weekly, so if that does sound like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Shad Therian. Welcome to the Upper Midwest, folks. Today, we're landing in Wisconsin, also affectionately known as the Badger State. So, where do we begin with this place? Known for its cold winters, vast dairy farms, ginseng production, and breweries, Wisconsin is a state that really knows how to provide comfort through the coldest of days. With a population of just under 6 million people, it is the 20th most popular state in America. However, where we're heading today is a little more on the rural side of life. Found at the northern ends of I-41 and I-43, you can find the unassuming city of Green Bay. In what started as a trading post, namely along a fur trading route, Green Bay is now home to just over 100,000 residents, making it a city with more than enough to do, but not so densely packed that it becomes overwhelming. Its key points of interest include Fox River, Lambeau Field Stadium, Bay Beach Amusement Park, and of course, Bay Beach Wildlife Sanctuary. If you're craving something a little more domesticated, head downtown and you'll find the Alton Theatre and East Town Mall. Now, the National Railroad Museum may not be for everyone, but every October it hosts Terror on the Fox, a themed train ride and haunted house which is often titled to be one of the best in America. Perhaps a bit of a weird flex, but Green Bay is best known as the toilet paper capital of the world, with thanks to its dedication to the toilet paper industry. And I guess, unfortunately, this fact fits our story today because shit really did hit the fan. One of those previously living in Green Bay was a young man named Shad Therian. Born on September the 7th, 1997, to Tara Pakinich and Michael Therian, Shad had two sisters and one brother. After attending Bayport High School, Shad later worked with his father and grandfather in the family businesses. And on the side, he was a gifted artist, namely in the medium of wood carving. Friends and family described Shad as a kind and compassionate man who loved the great outdoors and was passionate about art and loved to spend time with people he cared about. But sadly, we otherwise don't know too much about him. It is assumed that Shad's family are keeping his past confidential in order to respect his memory. Because little did Shad know that, very soon, he was about to meet someone who would end his life in the most tragic of ways. And her name was Taylor Coronado, later known as Taylor Shabiznes. And if you're wondering why the name change, well, that is none of your Shabiznes. Just kidding, it was through marriage. But a little more complicated than that. We'll get to this in just a minute. So, before we continue with this case, let's first understand who Taylor was, and what made her such a terrible person. Focusing on Taylor, she was born in Chicago on November the 23rd, 1997, to her mother Marla and father Arturo. Now, sadly, her family history leaves a trail of concerning details and information. Her mother passed away from liver cirrhosis and the effects of alcoholism when Taylor was just 12 years old, leaving her with just her father and her brother. It was during seventh grade that, after teachers addressed their concerns about her deteriorating behavior, that she reportedly received mental health treatment. Moving forward, to her senior year, she was also expelled after getting into a fight with another student. And it's reported that Taylor never graduated from high school. It was around this time that Taylor moved to Texas to live with her grandparents, 
which, by the way, was probably for the best. This was because, several years later, her father was eventually charged with domestic abuse in 2017. The man was subsequently sentenced to 12 years in prison only one year later, after being found guilty of second-degree assault of a child. It is unknown if Taylor experienced any of this in her own childhood, but the news would have certainly been sure to destroy her sense of trust in her own paternal figure. Disaster would strike once again when her brother tragically died in a motorbike accident in 2022, of course, leaving his sister absolutely distraught. It is reported that she spent time in and out of a psychiatric centre because she wasn't in a fit state of mind. Taylor was also put on medication after this. Saying this, her father, who was and still is behind bars, was worried about her mental and physical health regardless. It was in the year 2018 that Taylor married a man named Warren Chabot and, after marrying, they both legally changed their surname to Shabiznes. By the way, this Warren guy seems just as wild as she does. We'll get to the reasons why throughout this video. Anyway, now legally recognized as Taylor Denise Shabiznes, she lived all over Texas before finally relocating to Wisconsin. She made dream catchers, beaded jewelry, and art in her spare time. And although she tried to profit from these hobbies, she didn't seem to be very successful with it. She also ran a GoFundMe page. You can see the video right here. Hi, I'm Taylor Shabiznes, and I'm a very hardworking, dedicated individual that's broke and really needs money to help get that swole on. So if you could please donate to this GoFundMe page, be greatly appreciated, thank you. However, life wasn't all too peachy. Taylor was arrested in June 2020, charged with battery and threatening and resisting a police officer. She was later found guilty after pleading no contest. And it's also worth mentioning here, but at the very least, she had a passing fascination with the serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer. One year later, in 2021, Taylor and Warren had a child together. However, this newborn happiness was very short-lived, because soon after, Warren was arrested under charges of conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine and was therefore sentenced to 28 months in prison. Now, Warren didn't seem to be too embarrassed about this, because on his own Facebook page, while ironically misspelling his own surname, he said, Warren King Shabizanis, currently at Dodge County Jail in Wisconsin. Anyone who knows me, reach out to me, or send you info on here, and I'll get it that way so I can reach out to you. In the meantime, Taylor's own crimes had a sentence to three years of probation and 60 days in jail. However, it looked like she had her own plans instead of simply serving her time. The young woman skipped bail, which eventually resulted in her being arrested again. This time, it was for resisting a police officer, fleeing from an officer in a vehicle, and also being in possession of drug paraphernalia. Now, it is important to pay attention to that last charge, because Taylor was no stranger to drug abuse, and as we approach her time with Chad Therian, her affinity towards narcotics was becoming much more troublesome. You know, I swear that this is a reoccurring problem with my American cases, but despite breaking her previous probation, she received no additional jail time, instead receiving two more years of probation. You would think that, after five additional charges over two separate cases, the system would have some sort of common sense to put her back behind bars. Yeah, well, you'd be mistaken, because this didn't happen. Sadly, we've seen victims such as Eve Carson, and even last week's case of Lauren McCluskey, die due to the system's leniency of probation abuse. And tragically, this case is no different. Taylor remained in the community of Green Bay, and although she was able to steer clear of any trouble with law enforcement, she continued to use and abuse drugs. It was around this time, and just after her husband was sent to prison, that she met the sweet but somewhat troubled Shad Therian. The two enjoyed each other's company, and shared a somewhat familiar friendship group. They also reportedly shared similar interests, and began to spend most of their time together. This is probably why, after beginning to frequently use meth together, that the two started sleeping with each other. Some sources state that while Shad claimed to be in love with Taylor and wanted a family, Taylor did not view the relationship in the same way. Apart from technically being married to Warren and still having a child, she viewed her relationship with Shad as nothing more than a casual fling. Unfortunately, Shad himself was no stranger to trouble with the police. It was on October the 22nd, 2021, that he was arrested for disorderly conduct and resisting an officer. And despite his mugshot being in the public domain, not much other information 
information is available about the incident. It is clear though that, despite this trouble, Shad still had a good heart and was well loved by his friends and family. And it is worth noting that he was never in trouble for anything greatly nefarious. Moving into the terrible events of today's story, we find ourselves on a cold and snowy day on February the 22nd, 2022. It was during the daytime that Taylor and a friend picked up Shad in her van, before the three of them went on to her apartment, which was located on Eastman Avenue. Typical to their habits, they shared a few joints before moving on to the harder stuff, that being their usual choice of methamphetamine. It was shortly after this that their third-wheeling friend decided to go home, this of course leaving Shad and Taylor alone together. The two then recreationally injected trazodone into their systems, which, by the way, is a prescription drug used to treat anxiety and depression. And despite being heavily under the influence of multiple drugs, they then decided to drive to Shad's mother's house to hang out in his basement bedroom. This was also something they'd habitually begun to do in recent weeks. And while here, they once again hit more of the hard stuff. Now, methamphetamine is an extremely potent stimulant that rapidly increases dopamine in the brain. Under the influence, users become highly energetic, erratic, and sexually active. It is also worth noting that people can go from acting entirely normal to behaving in a totally unrecognizable manner. Repeated meth use can also induce spontaneous bouts of anxiety, mania, paranoia, and even hallucinations and all of these symptoms are relevant in today's case. Shortly after 9.30pm, Shad's mother Tara left the house. She knew that Shad had company, as she could faintly hear the two downstairs. However, the walls bore no clue as to what they were up to. She couldn't make out what they were doing. All she knew was that she could hear Taylor's voice. As they consumed more of the stimulant, Taylor and Shad's thoughts and desires turned towards that of BDSM, this involving the use of dog collars and chains. But it was on this evening that Taylor would take things all too far. As a brief side note, BDSM can be a practice enjoyed by a wide range of people, and can be extremely safe despite external appearances. However, it is vital to have a basic safe word system in place, and for both parties to be of sound mind. Neither of these things applied to Shad and Taylor on this evening, so the disaster was almost inevitable. Fleeting past the details, she ignored any and all signs of him struggling against her own actions. Taylor was caught up in a violent, chemically-induced euphoria, which, tragically, ended in her choking Shad to death. Despite blood appearing from his mouth, Taylor wanted to see what would happen, and sadly, it was here that Shad took his final breath. However, this wouldn't be the end of Taylor's morbid actions. After he died, Taylor continued to play with his body in a manner that I honestly don't want to talk about. But in the morning hours, she dismembered him with various butter knives that she found in his mother's kitchen. After cuddling up to his headless corpse, she fled the scene with one of his legs. Now, initially, her plan was to take all of his remains back home, but in such a delusional state, she actually forgot about the rest of him after packing just one limb. At around 2 a.m that morning, Shad's mother returned home with her partner. The house was silent, and everything appeared to be normal, and so, after heading upstairs, the two fell asleep soundly. But that is when, at around 3am, Tara was awoken by the sound of a slamming door. After hearing the vehicle drive away, she assumed it was Taylor, and so it was in that moment that Tara headed downstairs to see if her son had left with her or remained behind. She may not have cared about Taylor all that much, but she deeply cared about her son, despite the company he unwisely chose to keep. Wanting to say goodnight and check in on him before going back to sleep, she made her way to the basement door, and after reaching the bottom of the stairs, she noticed a light that appeared to be on through the door. Now, nothing seemed to be out of the ordinary. However, after turning around to walk back upstairs, she noticed a misplaced bucket on the floor, with a towel haphazardly covering the top of it. As the primary caretaker of the home, Tara knew where everything was and where they should be. The bucket caught her attention because it never usually was placed there. And of course, the towel on top of it created further intrigue. Approaching the bucket, she carefully lifted the towel to see what was inside. And horrifyingly, at that moment, she discovered the severed head of her son. In both shock and disbelief, Tara screamed for her partner. They dialed 911 immediately. Brown County Public Safety, how may I help you? Oh, yes, I'm an officer at 829 Stony Brook. Um, my friend just woke me up. Where's that she found her severed head of her son in the basin? Okay, okay, tell me what's happening there again. I have no clue what's happening with my girl. Where's that she found her 
severed head of her son in the basement. Did you go down there? In a bucket. I went down, I can't tell what the fuck is. I just part of my leg was up, I kind of got freaked out. Whose head is it? She's claiming it's her son. How old is her son? 24, 20, 25. Is it or? No, yeah, he was here yesterday with some chick and then now all of a sudden nobody's here. And um, you said you went down there, correct? Yeah, and I lifted a toe, but I can't, I, I can't see very well and I can't tell what the hell it is. So there's something in the bucket. There's right something in the got There's something in the goddamn bucket there. You think she's hallucinating or do you think that... I don't think so. I went down and there's something in the damn bucket. I, mean, I can't, I, I don't know, man. And she's a little freaked out and kind of freaking me out. Hello? Hi, Tara. So can you tell me what's going on? Are you positive my son's head is in a bucket? I am not get to my basement. What, may, what, oh. what makes you think that? Because I looked in the bucket. And what did you see? Exactly what I told you. Okay, where, where's the, uh, where's the rest of the body at? No idea. Okay. Responding to the phone call just before 4am, officers at the scene were met with a very gruesome sight. Bucket aside, the basement mattress was covered in blood and bodily fluids. Officers also found severed male organs alongside two knives. As several officers inspected the crime scene, others were out looking for Taylor. The first place they looked was her registered home address, where they found her vehicle parked outside. And one concerning detail that was left behind, it appeared that there was blood in front of it. Hey. Um, is this blood? Does this look like blood to you? Or am I just tripping? Bloody footprint? As police officers crunched through the cold, snow-covered pavement to investigate the van, Taylor walked out of her apartment with a visibly blood-stained sweatshirt and congealing red marks on her hands. She seemed completely unfazed as police approached her. Taylor, you have one more thing. You have one more thing. Just put your hands behind your back, please. Anybody else in your apartment? You got blood on your hands here, too. No, on your hands. Officers temporarily detained Taylor, while other officers went up into her apartment to look around for any other evidence of foul play. Meanwhile, downstairs, others were still attempting to open the vehicle. Finally getting into the van, they found one of Shad's legs inside a cardboard box. With this gruesome discovery, they promptly placed Taylor under arrest, before taking her to the station for interrogation and processing. As her interrogation began, detectives noticed cuts on her thumb and the back of her hand, along with other scratches on her arms and hands. While speaking with detectives, Taylor revealed graphic and disturbing details of the night's events. This included her describing her actions with Shad's body as if she found the whole experience to be casually amusing. At one point, she even said, I was sucking and cutting at the same time. I liked it. But when did you start, you know, cutting up his body? I don't know, like, almost right away. I was sucking and cutting at the same time. So would this be considered foreplay? Yeah. Yeah, it was. And then, um, I don't know. And then um, I just didn't stop. I don't know why. I didn't stop. I didn't stop. You guys done something like this in the past? Not like that. Do you use manual strangulation during sex at all? The shed like that? A um, um, manual strangulation? Yes, 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 yes. And you do too, or just him? Both of us. Okay, so you didn't. All right, but when was the last time you did? I mean, I played with him a little after. Um. Alright, so you like being strangled, like having the, your, your airway, or do you like doing it to somebody else? I like doing it to somebody else. So when he, when he put the chain on his neck, he thought that you guys were going to have kinky sex. Right? He 
you think that's what Chad was thinking? Yeah. What were you thinking? I was going to do the same thing. You know, I was going in, and I did. I already know I'm going to choke him, and I did. He likes it. Alright. So I was going to walk him like a dog. And he wanted that? I have no idea what I'm gonna do it anyway. Taylor can be seen laughing throughout various parts of the interrogation, adding that Chad's head was the first thing she took off, and that she was very excited about abusing his lifeless body. You said that she played with his penis? Yes. After he was dead? Oh, yeah. The chain goes around his neck and you started choking him. And you just realized that he was gonna die or what? I think I went a little too far because, like, like, I, I was blacking out while I was doing it, right? So when did you realize that Chad was not alive anymore? Um, you know, his face turned purple. Okay. He was coughing off blood and he was this Did you want Chad to be dead? No. No, it was out of random. Like, I wasn't expecting that, and it kind of threw me off guard. Hey, you, you, you also said that you enjoyed it, right? And I enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. Alright. Yeah. You ever love something so much that you kill it? Like, it, it happens to me. That's the feeling that I have. I love something so much that I kill it. Like, oh, I love it so much, and then I kill it. That's what happens to me. Other quotes include, I don't even know anymore. I was riding him like a donkey. I started pulling and I don't know. I don't know why I didn't stop. Later during the interrogation, Taylor confessed that she did not tell her roommate what had happened when she got back to her apartment. And then, um, I know I forgot the head. I wanted the head. Did you bring anything with you? Yeah, it's in the van. What? It's in the van. It's, um, what is it? She also seemingly took pleasure in taunting the officers, saying the police are going to have fun trying to find all of the organs. Well, you're gonna have fun trying to look for all the organs, but um, yeah, they're, they're all dismembered. Following all of this extremely disturbing information, Taylor was held on a $2 million bond while forensics and investigators compiled evidence for her trial. Of course, with a case as insane as her business, she was ordered to be psychologically evaluated, and in May of 2022, she was deemed to be of sound mind and fit to stand trial. Despite confessing to her crimes in rather great detail, the judge actually entered a not guilty plea on her behalf before scheduling her trial for October of 2022. However, Taylor would then change her plea to not guilty by reason of insanity in September of 2022, thus delaying her trial while she was psychologically evaluated yet again. But Taylor was on borrowed time, and by November of that same year, she was once again deemed to be competent and fit to stand trial. Naturally, Taylor's defense team tried to justify her statements by explaining that she was under the severe influence of methamphetamine and trazodone at the time. They requested to the judge to disqualify all comments made to officers during her arrest and while being interrogated. It was argued that Taylor was so out of her mind at the time of these two instances that anything she may have said could have been entirely fictional and fantasized from her own delusions. They also asked for all charges of sexual assault to be dropped as, quote, the victim was already deceased at the time. Well, to no one's surprise, the judge rightfully denied all three requests. Now, it is understandable that a defense team has the duty to defend their client to the best of their ability. However, as these cases often go, Taylor's defense team induced much outrage across the community of Green Bay. To even argue that a victim is unable to be assaulted after they are deceased is morally wrong. Many feel that the defense team overstepped their duty here, even going as far to discriminate and punish Shad beyond his death simply because he was was also a drug user himself. It is worth mentioning that throughout Taylor's life, she had been diagnosed with multiple mental health conditions, this including bipolar disorder, ADD, ADHD, and severe depression. Moving back to the trial, to shed further light on the night of the murder, the judge called upon several witnesses to stand and share their experiences. In order to fully grasp the mental capacity of Taylor during and after the murder, the court heard testimonies from Officer Garth Russell and Detective Kevin Kempf. Russell was the officer who arrested Taylor at her apartment, 
statement, and Kemp conducted her interrogation. When Officer Russell arrested Taylor, he noted that she appeared calm, and did not seem to be under the influence of drugs when he took her into custody. Her relaxed demeanour was quite abnormal, as she hadn't even bothered to clean Shad's blood off her clothes or her body. She seemed casually smug as she spoke with the officers, and even talked back with an attitude while they were questioning her. Despite her demeanour being out of the ordinary, Officer Russell testified that she seemed to be completely mentally aware throughout the early morning. She was not showing any telltale signs of delusions or psychosis while he or other officers spoke to her. Detective Kempf was next to the stand. He testified that Taylor was both lucid and fully competent while she recounted the murder. She was able to sit in a chair, talked to officers, collected her thoughts, and was able to clearly describe the night's events, which later matched all information and evidence found at the crime scene. Both testimonies clearly demonstrated that not only was Taylor fully aware of what she was doing, but that she also took great pleasure in the murder and, indeed, in recounting the details to officers. This debate about Taylor's sanity delayed the legal proceedings of this case quite heavily, and this was by intentional design of her defence team too. After months of setback, the judge agreed to finally set the trial for May the 15th. However, in February of 2023, and potentially in a last-ditch attempt to prove her mental instability, Taylor launched out of her seat in the courtroom and attacked her own attorney, this accidentally being recorded for the whole world to see. It is clear that Taylor wanted to create as much of a spectacle as possible to get the attention of the judge and the media, and after more than a year of delays, setbacks, pleas of insanity, and calculatingly despicable behaviour in the courtroom, her trial was finally scheduled for July the 24th, 2023. As an unfortunate standard practice in homicide cases, the family and friends of Shad had to relive the horrific details of his death. Many of them learned new details never known before, further intensifying the nightmare that was happening all around them. However, in stark contrast to this, it looks like Taylor was enjoying playing the role of a deranged killer. She was often seen smiling and smirking in the courtroom, her facial expressions and humour disrespectfully downplaying the intense gravity of the situation. Now sometimes, especially when cases like these are delayed for so long, the defence team and the defendant can attempt to change the narrative of the story. This can possibly cast doubt into the minds of the public, and even sway opinion, thus sometimes making it difficult to reach an agreed upon verdict. However, in this case, the jury remained absolutely strong. With so much evidence on the table, and with many testimonies and examples to draw from, the jury didn't need much time to reach a decision. While she was waiting for the verdict, Taylor was again seen with a grin on her face, as if convinced that, due to her efforts, she would somehow come out not guilty. However, as you can see, her expression very quickly changed when the verdict was delivered. And my understanding is that the jury has reached a verdict, is that correct? Yes. Right. If you would hand that to the bailiff then, please. The first verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabiznis, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. The second verdict reads as follows. We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabiznis, guilty of mutilating a corpse as charged in count two of the information. The next verdict reads, We, the jury, find the defendant, Taylor Denise Shabiznis, guilty of third-degree sexual assault as charged in count three of the information. Dated this date, 26th day of July, 2023, signed by the four person. Taylor Shabiznis was found to be guilty of homicide, third-degree sexual abuse, and mutilating a corpse. Just one hour later, the jury also ruled that she demonstrated no mental illness capable of interfering with rational thought during or after the murder. This meaning she will face a sentence behind bars, and not in a mental institution. The verdict seems to be in order, and I will read it as follows. Question one. At the time the crimes were committed, did the defendant have a mental disease or mental defect? Answer, no. Taylor's sentencing will likely happen in September 2023, where it is widely expected that she will be given life in prison, potentially without parole. This will be the maximum punishment, as Wisconsin does not enforce the death penalty, which in this state was abolished in 1853. This case is multifaceted and unique in a variety of ways, and shocking details aside, I believe that Taylor is someone who requires much more evaluation. And despite being diagnosed with several mental health conditions in the past, she was not diagnosed with anything throughout her trial.
Although Warren is a wild card himself and makes some pretty bizarre statements, he does have some crucial insight at times. In a Facebook post, he said, My wife might be locked up for a long time, if not for life. But what the world or community don't understand is, my release date is soon. Either way, my prayers go out to my wife, Taylor Shabusiness. She needs help mentally. Hopefully soon, the courts will realise that she needs help. People like to be nosy, I get that. People judge, I get that too. It's what the world does and will continue to do. Not only has her addiction played a big role, but so does her mental background, as well as postpartum depression. I just want my wife to get help. Professional help. There is clearly something abnormal about her. You can see that through her mannerisms and obviously through her actions. And although I believe that she is mentally competent, I don't think that we know enough. This case has been making the rounds to the true crime community for obvious reasons. But shocking details aside, it is quite easy for us to forget the actually important person to today's case. And that, of course, is our victim, Shad Therian. Shad was only 24 years old when his life was brutally taken from him. It is clear to see that he greatly valued his family, living with his mother while working with his father at the family business. Even I can see a few similarities with him. He loved his cat, was a creative at heart, and enjoyed woodworking. He was also a romantic at heart too, even if Taylor didn't feel the same way. And although the lifestyle he chose is not something I or most of us would choose, he did not deserve to lose his life as a result. He is survived by his mother, father, sisters, and brother. I hope that, through these extremely difficult days, his family will one day gather the strength to find peace. Following her son's death, Tara had to take a significantly long period of time off work and sadly has fallen into financial hardship. Her family are holding a GoFundMe to help offset this financial challenge, and I'm sure any help will be greatly appreciated. If you do feel compelled to, I'll leave a link in the comments down below. It has to be said, but everyone is a loser here, especially Taylor's child, who will now have to grow up without a mother. I think I'm gonna wrap this case up here today, folks. I think I've pretty much covered all bases, but I really do appreciate you watching this video, so thank you so much for making it this far. All in all, a very sad case with no winners or survivors. I am really interested to hear your thoughts on this case. For one, do you think that Taylor had been misdiagnosed for years? And second of all, do you think she did it due to a drug-fueled rampage, or do you think this was malicious intent? You know what to do. As always, please leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. And again, as always, I'll be back again very soon for another video. Honestly, I have so many interesting cases that are upcoming, and some of them you will not expect. Anyway, until we see each other again, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.